someone were to ask you, do you sincerely want to be happy? You'd probably say, of course. But if someone were to look at your life, is that the conclusion they would draw? That you do want to be happy sincerely? We all come to the Dharma because we're suffering in one way or another. We want to find a way out. But we often place conditions on the way out. I want to be happy and preserve this. I want to be happy and preserve that. And it's normal. After all, we're suffering, and part of suffering is that you're bewildered. Part of you doesn't really know what's going on and doesn't really know why you're suffering. This is why each of us has a lot of strange preconceived notions about what the path is going to be like and what the goal is going to be like. And it's okay to practice anyhow, even with your strange notions. Because if you wait till you get everything cleared up first, you'll never get to the practice. It's through practicing that we learn, that we begin to recognize the things that we're holding on to that we thought might be good, thought might be worthwhile, but actually part of the cause of suffering. was talking about the, the root of what is skillful in the mind. It doesn't come from any innate goodness or any innate compassion or innate wisdom, aside from the wisdom of heedfulness, seeing that there is danger out there and there's danger in here, and that your actions are going to make a difference. It's going to be your actions that determine whether you're going to fall into those dangers or not. When you realize that much, you realize you've got to get a lot clearer about what you're actually doing in terms of thoughts, words, deeds. This is why we work on mindfulness. This is why we work on alertness. The alertness is there to watch what's actually happening. And the mindfulness is to remind ourselves, okay, we did this, and what are the results going to be? So that you can actually connect the causes with the effects. And we start on a crude level, and we work up to more and more refined levels. But this is the basic pattern And his teachings that the Buddha gave to Rahula. You try something that seems to be okay, it's not going to harm anybody. And why don't you want to harm anybody? Well, you realize it's going to come back at you. Again, it's through heedfulness that we develop compassion. It's heed through heedfulness that we develop integrity, truthfulness. all the good qualities that we're going to need on the path. Heedfulness combined with the desire for happiness. And as you get more and more refined, you begin to see areas where your original motivation was confused, or actually corrupt in one way or another. But it's not like the corruption is going to spoil everything. When you see that you've got something wrong in your motivation and it's been causing stress, you've got the choice. Do you want to hold on to it or do you want to let go? So we bring the mind to the concentration, usually with some confused motives. In the concentration, the mindfulness allow for the discernment that's going to allow us to see where the confusion lies. As we can see, that it really does cause suffering, causes stress one way or another. As you stick with a concentration, it sensitizes you to levels of stress you may not have even noticed before. You just took it as 
part of the background noise, something you could take for granted. Sometimes we need outside help to point out to us areas that we've gotten complacent about, or types of suffering or stress that we say, well, nobody can escape this kind of suffering, nobody can escape this kind of stress. That's where we get complacent, i.e. the opposite of heedful. That's what cuts us off. But it's best if we don't need to depend on that outside voice, if we can keep prodding ourselves. Say, so there must be something better than this. If there's the least little bit of stress, the least little bit of feeling burdened in the mind, there's something wrong. Of course, where do you look for something wrong? You turn around and look inside. You try to see the stress arising, the stress passing away, and try to notice, well, what's arising along with it? What's passing away along with it? It's all very simple when you come right down to it. It's simply a question of trying to stay simple ourselves, because it's our inner complexity that allows some of our less skillful motives to hide out, it provides safe harbor for them. But if you can strip things down simply to action and result, what kinds of results you're getting, keeping in mind that you can always change your actions. That's what helps to sort everything out. And it's your heedfulness that's going to overcome whatever is unskillful in your motivation, whatever is neurotic, whatever is egotistical, whatever is whatever that's not quite right. In other words, your bewilderment. Your heedfulness is what's going to get you past all those things. When you finally realize, I can't afford to hold on to this. It's like being out in a little tiny boat in the ocean. And you've got a lot of belongings in the boat, and you begin to realize that those belongings are what's going to cause the boat to sink. So you throw away a little bit here and a little bit there and think, well, that must be, that might be enough. But see, the boat is still sinking, so you've got to throw away more, throw away more. And if you sink this time, we can come back the next time. But there comes a the question of how many times do you want to sink before you've had enough, before you're willing to let go of some of the things you've been holding on to. Does that statement in Zen. Now, the great way is not difficult for those with no preferences. And this doesn't mean you don't prefer anything at all. You do have a preference. You would rather not suffer. But when it comes to what you're going to have to give up and what you're going to have to develop as part of the path, you can't let your preferences get in the way. And so it's normal that we're going to resist giving up some things, resist developing some things. But you want your heedfulness to help you overcome that resistance, and the simple fact that there is suffering and stress when you don't overcome that resistance. When you ask yourself, have you had enough of that? Because if you hold on to subtle defilements, they're going to ca cause trouble down the line. They may seem perfectly harmless compared to some of the really gross defilements that are out there, or in the mind, or that have been in the mind. But the Buddha says it's like having even a little bit of excrement under your fingernail. fingernail. It doesn't have to be much. A tiny little bit, it still smells bad. So you want to keep searching out. There are dangers in here. This may sound depressing or may sound negative, but it's a simple fact. And the whole purpose of the practice is learning how to find happiness in the midst of a lot of 
suffering in the world. We realize that we can't end other people's sufferings. We can make sure that we're as little a burden as possible on other people. But the issue of the suffering that goes deep into the mind, that's each person's responsibility. And you want to take care of that, because the more you're suffering, the more you do place a burden on others. This is why this is not a selfish path. So you find that you do hang on to this and hang on to that, even though it's not skillful. But you also find yourself running into the suffering that comes from that. And it's simply a matter of learning how to detect it and then learning how to ask yourself, have you had enough? And it's in this way that we purify our motivation, purify our actions. And the mind doesn't really get totally pure until our hardship. So you can't wait until your mind is pure before you start to practice. You can't wait till your motivation is entirely healthy before you start to practice. You start with the motivation you've got. And it's the combination of your heedfulness and your sincere desire not to suffer. That's what's going to see you through. I say that at John Munn, his last Dharma talk, made the point that all the various elements of the path are your weapons or your support for the warrior in the mind. Now, what is the warrior in the mind? It's the determination not to come back and suffer again. That's something you want to encourage. So it's this desire for happiness, the desire not to suffer, and your heedfulness, realizing that you've had enough. And if you're not really careful, there's going to be more, more suffering, more pain, more burdens, and burdens on the mind. So it's through heedfulness that we become good. It's through heedfulness that the mind is purified. Not that we start out pure, but we can get there. So that's what you hold on to. And use that determination, that heedfulness, to sort everything else out. <laughs>